That's Holy awesome. crap, guys. Five years have passed gas. We are here. Uh, it feels like a blink of an eye, honestly. It really does. Now it's time you guys should do a past gas about On the, the past gas, because that's how old it is. It would be a four-minute episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, today we're talking about one of the greatest, maybe the greatest, motorcycle driver. Motorcycle driver? That's what they call them, though. Motorcycle rider, racer pilot. of all time. Motorcycle pilot. Nice. Valentino Rossi, the GOAT. Number 46. Uh, we talk about Travulia. We talk about his dad. Yeah. We talk about who's the, his uh, rivalry with Max Biaggi, yes. which was one of the you know first internet uh, things that blew up the internet, which wasn't that hard back then because it was just like four tubes. We <laughs> talk about acceptable contact on the track, and yeah, I mean this guy had what what a what a accomplished career. Definitely the goat. Or is he? Well, we're going to find out. We can debate that in the comments. Okay, let's get going. Let's press the clutch and put in the first gear. Riding south on the western coast of Italy is absurdly picturesque. Green rolling hills spotted with villages populate the view on the right, while white stones bleached by both sun and salt buffer the coastline of the Adriatic Sea on the left. Along this idyllic route lies Tavulia a commune of around 8,000 souls that has been inhabited since the Middle Ages. Upon entering, a strange sign would catch the eye of the uninitiated. The speed limit suddenly drops from 50 kph to 46 kilometers per hour for seemingly no reason. But if you're riding a motorcycle, chances are you know exactly why. Tavulia is the home of Valentino Rossi, arguably the greatest motorcycle racer of all time. While arguments about who is or who is not the GOAT litter the media landscape in every conceivable discipline, sport or otherwise, Rossi's dominance of the conversation is a veritable chiaroscuro of opinions, and like the balance of light and dark in the paintings from which that term was derived oh! and I just learned about, oh, that's what. <laughs> Valentino's legacy is not derived from any one element of his professional career. He was fast, he was smart, and maybe most importantly, he was beloved. Today on Past Gas, we're talking MotoGP's Valentino Rossi. How did he come to dominate MotoGP at such a critical time? Why was he so adored? And is he the GOAT? Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars. It's not about ports. Some people just know that they can save money on their car insurance by checking Allstate first. Just like how I check my fluids and tires first before going on a long road trip. I don't want these hot summer temperatures to mess with my car. Checking first is smart. So check Allstate first and see how much you could save on car insurance. You're in good hands with Allstate. Potential savings vary, including based on how you buy. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, Northbrook, Illinois. My name's Nolan Sykes. Welcome to Pass Gas. I can't read today. You can read just fine. I can't do it. I, f I messed that up so many times. The edit's it's not just gonna... Italian is a little blind spot in your beautiful mind. It's not mind. just Italian. It's actually reading <laughs> He's normal gonna get sentences. an MRI. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a big hole. And the guy's like, yeah. oh, this is a, oh, this is yeah. the Italian spot. Oh, you see, did too much just... like Italian MDMA in your yeah. 20s. And now <laughs> you wish. have a hole in your brain. <laughs> I didn't do anything in my 20s, man. I played video games and watched YouTube. And that's why I'm like this. But you, I mean, you, you You're throw French at Nolan, you throw mm -hmm. Japanese oh, at French, Nolan. Yeah, he, thank you. He pronounces everything a perfect. A perfect. A perfecto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my my co-host this week across from me, Bart Bidlingmeyer, Bids Bardo. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Again. You're welcome, dude. Yeah, of course. And uh, Joe Weber. Hey, what's up? Uh, I'm back again. <laughs> <laughs> I like every week. Uh, Bart. You want to, yeah. why did your parents name you after the Bay Area Rapid Transit? I was actually conceived on that train. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Putting the rapid in rapid transit. Uh, um, I, you know, it's not true. what's that, what's that effect where you, like you buy a car and then you see the car everywhere? Yeah. What's that effect I think, called? Um, they call it the Grand Theft Auto effect. Oh, really? No, I don't. The I don't Bader Meinhof? I don't think, I don't think. Is that what it is? Isn't Master Bader Meinhof? Yeah. Isn't anyways, Bader Meinhof, isn't that like a terrorist group or something? Uh, Didn't you're they thinking hijack of, a plane? Um, Stockholm Syndrome, right? Uh, it's a, all those things. But anyways, <laughs> so the reason that 
I wanted to put. I wanted to do an episode on Valentino Rossi because you're Sicilian. I saw, no, sorry, he's not Sicilian. He's a mainlander. Oh, he's part of the West Coast, mm-hmm. like by Naples. Um, I do kind of feel an affiliation with the Na- Napoli people because mm-hmm. <laughs> they're really scrappy mm-hmm. and the whole country kind of looks at them as like these low class people which is also how they look at Sicilians and I'm Sicilian. Because that's, we, we talked about this last time uh, with like this divide between North and South in Italy. Yeah, that's one part of it too. Yeah, South is like, it's kind of analogous to the US where mm-hmm. it's like, um, you know, socioeconomic differences between the two. But also just like this attitude, like uh, Northern Italians are more, they're closer to Switzerland, they're closer mm-hmm. to Germany. Yeah, yeah. And they kind of act like that too. and. Uh, you know, Milan's up there. Milan's a very metropolitan city. Um, Do the Alps go through Italy? There is Italian Alps. Okay. Yeah. The um, Dolomites ah. are part of, there's some Dolomites in Italy. There's also some Dolomites in Eastern France too, where you were. I think that's the start of Monaco is like okay. the start of the Dolomites. Okay. But anyways, he's got that kind of attitude of like this, oh, you think you're better than me? Mm-hmm. Kind of like blue collar attitude. Um, I love that, that chip on the shoulder. Milwaukee's like that too. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like I have a strong affiliation with it. The attitude that he took into MotoGP, which is a little stuffy. These guys are crazy, by the way. If you've ever seen yeah. MotoGP footage, they're lunatics. I had no idea. Okay, this is going to sound really stupid. I did not know the bikes went as fast as they yeah. do. They hit like 200 at the end of the straights. Because yes. it looks so effortless. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. crazy. Bro. And they're fully like... They're, sideways they're fu- the yeah turns. going in the turns they're like leaning fully off sorry i'm going away from the mic they're leaning fully off the bike they're like, dragging they're, their it's knee. so physical yeah moto gp yeah i'd say like out of all the racing i think they're the most fit and they're also the stringiest dudes that's what too. i was gonna say they're yeah. so like wiry yeah you know and you wouldn't think that you could hang on to a bike yeah there's nothing yeah. to bolster you in yeah. so you're literally <laughs> using your you also body have, as guess, a pendulum What's less that? less mass throwing you off too yeah yeah, yeah if i was all, if i weighed 100 pounds less i could hop on that bike too okay Why'd we're gonna do- put that to the test <laughs> <laughs> next year when we yeah, have a budget I, <laughs> i'm down yeah down to 130 <laughs> he he likes to poke the bear a lot yeah so, and it works well for the internet and social media. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's talk about Valentino Rossi. Graziano Rossi was a Grand Prix motorcycle racer from 1977 to 1982 with three wins and five podiums. In the course of those five years, Graziano and his wife, Stefania, would welcome a son, young Valentino Rossi. He was born in Urbino, Italy in 1979. Young Valentino would spend his first three years of life watching his father race. That's such a good rap name, Young Valentino. (laughs) That's pretty good. Uh, So it comes to no surprise that he was excited to get on a bike himself. His mom, however, was not willing to put her toddler on a motorcycle. That's a weird-ass mom, if you ask me. (laughs) (laughs) Graziano was willing to compromise. So Valentino's first ride was in a 60cc go-kart which his father soon goosed up to 100 cc's. Valentino and his father would spend the formative years of his life training and eventually competing in the youth go-kart circuit. In 1990, at 11 years old, Valentino would win the regional go-kart title. By this point, however, young Valentino was already training on mini bikes, and wouldn't you know it, he won on those too, both national and European titles in 1992 and 1993. Have you guys ever uh, seen kid mini bike racing? Mm-hmm. Mini, it's pretty it's crazy well, it's kind of funny it is funny because they you know they're kids and their yeah. heads look and they're huge, exactly so, they're yeah. little helmet they're the big helmets on yeah. these little bikes yeah. <laughs> but I, it is impressive that, yeah you know, people will make good. cut downs of uh like european mini bike championship crash compilations and there's like <laughs> kids like sliding out and like crash all of them though they get right back up and hop yeah. on the bike again made out of rubber it's cr- yeah. yeah in 1993 valentino uh moved up to his first full-size motorcycle, a Caviga Mita 125 uh, that he promptly, allegedly, crashed out in the first turn of his first ride. He was gifted a factory new Caviga Mita by the owner of that company, which was a fortunate side effect of being literally born into the racing world. Must be nice. Valentino would compete for the next few years in the Italian sport production racing, 
winning championships in 1994 and 1995. A revealing quote from 2022 gives a snapshot into the dynamic between Graziano and his son. Valentino says, quote, Bart, do you want to do an Italian accent? No. <laughs> <laughs> All of our communications focus primarily on motorcycles. He wasn't a very good father. I mean, <laughs> when I was with him, for him, everything was always riding a motorcycle. <laughs> he never went to the park with me and he never played football with me. When we spent time together, he would look at me and say, oh, what do we do now? I ride a motorcycle because he was a racing driver. He didn't push me, but his influence on me was very great. I watched it and always wanted to ride it myself. While it would be unfair to try to understand anyone's relationship based on quotes from the press, it would seem that Valentino's determination was inherited, while his personality was a counterpoint to his own father's quiet and focused. So kind of like a Max Verstappen situation, but maybe oh, less abusive. Maybe. <laughs> More fostering. Well, yeah, maybe. While Graziano is described as a warm-hearted man, it would seem that young Valentino's drive to race was built on a common theme, the approval and attention of his father. And like any primal need, once Valentino had the attention and approval of his dad, he would try to hold on to it. Are you trying to get Oliver into any racing right now? No, not right now. It's just foot racing. Oh, foot is racing. he fast? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he will be or not. They're, they're <laughs> kids. They're, you know. Uh, what about any any other sports? We've done soccer and t-ball. How, does, how old is he now? Five, four? He's, oh, he's going to be six oh. at the end of the year. Okay. Damn. Yeah. So now it, it is time to start it's about, trying. It, it's that time. He yeah. likes soccer. He likes chicken, but coached basketball and it was you know it's just mindless yeah <laughs> you know when you're just like and their parents are all like we almost had him today and it's like yeah six nothing <laughs> <laughs> six nothing in a basketball <laughs> yeah, game yeah <laughs> you know like <laughs> and then oh, one time um one of the kids was like at you know timeout is like you're doing great if you could pass the ball yeah it's gonna get there sooner and then he was like mom told me not to pass what the <laughs> mom <laughs> yeah and so, so then i was like mom and she's like and it's like can he he can pass the ball right she goes yeah yeah see he told me you told him not to pass the ball <laughs> and all the other parents started laughing <laughs> it was a pretty good moment it Don't is funny them. how little kids just misinterpret stuff mm -hmm. and then no they... i think she told him not oh, to pass really? the ball <laughs> <laughs> so he could score points she's up in the stands with her iphone yeah. trying to highlights yeah that one guy's gonna make a video like uh <laughs> Young LeBron, or uh, yeah, yeah right. oh yeah, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, young uh, baby Gronk, baby, <laughs> baby Braun is the leading <laughs> prospect for the class of 2038 with baby six B career points. <laughs> baby Braun rising up, uh, yeah. Simone Biles. <laughs> um, that's hilarious. That's I, I sometimes when I wonder when I, I think it's back to the point. It's like if a kid takes an interest in something, then yeah, yeah, just Run more of it. it. Yeah, yeah. Do you, is it fun just kind of like throwing stuff at him and seeing if he likes it? If he can catch it <laughs> <laughs> or if it hits him. No, Are I'd you going to try to get yeah. Wyatt into, into disc golf, dude? Throw, put a little. That's like sixth on my list. Okay. I want to see if he likes skateboarding first. Oh. And then I want to toss a ball to him and see if he likes to play a catch, which mm -hmm. he probably will. Um, nice. And then cars. I'm going to, you know, once he's old enough, I want him to like shift, shift nice. for me. <laughs> the first time I was behind the wheel, I, I, I vividly remember this. We were coming back from the, the dump uh, in my uh, parents' El Camino. Mm -hmm. My dad put me on this, like on his lap, yeah. steering. And then like, I just like, we were coming up on like a gentle bend and mm -hmm. I just kept the car straight. <laughs> my dad was oh, like, no. got to turn on, got to turn. <laughs> Yeah, turn, you right, turn like, right at the edge, but it's like, oh shit! Like, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, hey, my kid loves the dump for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> some, sometimes you'd come get me. <laughs> <laughs> so, like his father before him, Valentino's sights were always set on MotoGP. And in 1996, at 18 years old, uh, Valle, Valle, as those close to him called him, made his debut. Valentino would choose the number 46 as his father had worn that number in 1979, his most successful racing year and the year that Valentino was born. Riding in the 125cc class for Aprilia, he would make his Grand Prix debut in Malaysia 
and later win his first race at the Czech Grand Prix in Brno. There's a uh, lack of vowels in that word. Vale would finish you his check yourself, Nolan. <laughs> hey, nice. Vale would finish his rookie season in ninth place. Not a great debut, but important motivation. It would be the last time he would finish a season outside the top three for over a decade. That's crazy. Pretty nuts. The following season, Valentino would take the 1997 championship in the 125cc division. His ascent was now paced as he would move up to the 250cc division in 1998, finishing the season second, and the following year he'd win the 1999 championship in that class. The stage is now set for Rossi to move in to the premier class. Valentino was already gaining attention, not just because of his abilities, but as a result of his effortlessly approachable personality. A goofy and playful teen, Valentino had all the hallmarks of a great entertainer. He was quick with a quote and funny, and most importantly, seemed not to take himself too seriously. What made Valentino so easy to root for was his ability to make it seem like he wasn't working too hard and that he was just having fun, an often elusive attitude in European professional racing. That's true. It's normally pretty buttoned up, and people have their canned responses. I feel like George Russell is a really good... <laughs> I He was the first person I thought of, actually. Yeah, where it's just like, oh, of course, yeah, that's exactly... If you were to write a chat GPT mm-hmm. yeah. response uh, as an F1 driver... That's what it would be. 2000 was the year Valentino Rossi made his 500cc debut, jumping from the Aprilia team to Honda. At 21 years old, Valentino's rookie season saw him win two races and finish the season in second place. While Valentino's popularity grew exponentially, it was natural. The more powerful bike, the higher the class, the higher the class, the bigger the audience. But a confluence of powerful forces would change the young rider's trajectory forever marking the 2001 season as the beginning of his unofficial coronation. The advent of the internet, thanks Al Gore, coupled with the proliferation and available media on cable TV, created an ideal international climate for a goofy and gifted kid from Italy to become a sensation. All that was needed was a compelling storyline, and the first race of the 2001 season provided one immediately. Did you watch Kimmy Schmidt? Yeah. When they described the internet? No. So the internet has an ebb and flow. It was created by Al Gore. <laughs> and this ebb and flow, a rhythm, if you will, determines what you see and what's heard. The Al Gore rhythm <laughs> has to end the Anyway. That's pretty good. Didn't really get into that show. Watched the first couple episodes. I was like, meh. It's, right. it's definitely it, of a time. If, yeah. you, if you watch that era... Every, yeah. Like 30 Rock is the same way. It's so fast paced. I love paced. 30 Rock though. Yes. Oh I know. My God. But after you binge a bunch of those type of episodes, you feel like you're going crazy because your head is like, yeah. it's so fast that you are just like yeah. spun around. Spun around, baby. Max Biaggi of Rome was a successful MotoGP rider, having won four championships in the 250cc class while Valentino was climbing the ranks. His premier class debut in 1999 gave him two years of racing the 500ccs by the time the season opener rolled around. Nicknamed the Roman Emperor, Biaggi was disliked by Valentino for a myriad of reasons. He was arrogant to the media and fans, dated supermodels, and ate alone. That last one really ticked Valentino off. (laughs) <laughs> I, I also feel like, are you sure he's the problem? <laughs> or do you just wish you were dating supermodels? I, I hate eating alone. Have you seen uh, the, there's all those influencer, it's, it's like, you know, like the man stuff where it's just work all the time mm-hmm. and you've got kill yourself don't do be not. happy and so one of them is joy like, is a, yeah. is a, is a yeah. weakness. Yeah. That yeah, one that trope bullshit. is that it's like. It's a, it's super driven if mm-hmm. you eat yeah. alone. Oh god, I don't yeah. get that. You're not wasting any time by talking to anyone while mm-hmm. you're shoving food in your. Gut. I don't have time for friends. Yeah, I'm business. I'm only. I'm only got, talking, my only friend is the hustle. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you're talking to friends, you're losing out on fifty to one hundred fifty dollars in that time. Uh, you could be making. You could be making. That, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I'm not worried about it because I have such uh, aggressive passive income. Yeah. I get to go to lunch <laughs> with my friends. Oh, yeah. see. Yeah. Your grind set is mm-hmm. goaded. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the guy uh, dated supermodels, ate alone. Important to note was also the century-old rivalry between the two cities' soccer or football teams, nicknamed the Derby del Sol, which had resulted in violence after games since 1987. 
Yeah. In a soap opera of motorcycle racing, Valentino cast Biaggi as a rich kid bully to his lovable scamp. Kind of like Mighty Ducks 2. It's basically every sports movie <laughs> yeah. for kids. Yeah. The two had allegedly had an argument in a restaurant years previously, and Valentino, a natural showman, had ridiculed Biaggi from afar ever since, as the two were not in the same division. When reports surfaced that Biaggi was dating Naomi Campbell, Valentino took a victory lap with a blow-up doll on his bike labeled Claudia Schiffer. <laughs> When Valentino progressed take to the, that. Yeah. yeah, take that. Take. When Valentino progressed to the 250 and, uh, uh, division. I did not just have this blow up doll laying around. <laughs> uh, we had to go out and buy it. <laughs> Chloe, okay. My fiance had her bachelorette party like months ago. Yeah. What happens at uh, the bachelorette party stays well, at the bachelorette party. Don't I know, but in she held on to this blow up doll that had my face on it. Oh. Printed and put on it. And it's still in the <laughs> trunk of her car. So every time I'll take I love driving her car. It's a, a older uh Lexus sedan. Yeah. Love mm-hmm. driving that thing around town. But when I go to get groceries or something and I pop that trunk open oh. just mm-hmm. in the parking lot, yeah. Yeah. Blow up doll right there for everybody to see. Chloe, get that out of your trunk. Come on. That'd be a funny At ass- least it's your face on it. Yeah. It's- People who don't know the context are start asking questions. They're like, why does the guy have a blow up doll of himself? Yeah, I think that's a super funny uh, YouTube prank is getting like twins Mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, like pulling up to like a crowded parking lot and there's like screaming from the trunk or whatever. You open it up and the same guy is in the trunk Yeah, and then they switch and then the other guy closes the trunk and the other guy starts, the other twin starts screaming and then they peel off. People are like, what the heck? Yeah. (laughs) Um, does it have like a big old dong on it? It doesn't. No. It, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, then keep it in the trunk. <laughs> so I yeah, am no longer interested. So Valentino's got the blow up doll on his bike. When Valentino progressed to the 250 division, he had a sticker on his helmet that said "Grazie Mick," tipping his hat to Michael Duhan, who had just beaten Biaggi after his advancement to 500 cc's. At the opener of the 2001 season in Suzuka, Japan, Valentino attempted to pass Biaggi on the outside during the starting line straightaway. Biaggi would veer left to block Valentino, who persisted, and as he started to push past him, Biaggi lifted his elbow, pushing Valentino's bike off the track at about 140 miles per hour. Literally elbows out racing. Valentino yep. would persevere and succeed in overtaking Biaggi on the next lap. After slowing, as he entered a turn and clearly giving Biaggi the finger, nice. Vale would win the race, telling the press afterwards, "I had to become a motocross rider at 220 kph, and I can guarantee you that's not a nice experience on a 500 cc." <laughs> if you know, if you've never seen it first, if you have seen the clip, you got to understand. I think it's like these. What it takes to knock these bikes yeah. is very little. Um, but uh, it, it's it's pretty badass his next lap and then just yeah at those speeds entering a turn flipping off the guy that <laughs> you just said is pretty that, gnarly that and it's also kind of like and then you win the race and then know? the confidence to be mm-hmm. able to do that <clears throat> yeah because um, i've seen it you know like the the foot races where people are like mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. mean mugging the other person and they trip yeah at the right before the yeah. finish line you gotta have mm-hmm. confidence for that kind of stuff yeah. and it also like you know, we're talking about this rivalry and it's like, well, did you, did he, did Biagi just create, um, his, his right, like make mm-hmm. him better because of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Almost like <clears throat> force him into this, uh, situation where they're like mm-hmm. actually now, Oh, now I have to beat you every time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's important to note that clear aggressive contact between riders was not usually tolerated by MotoGP. I know it seems silly to point out, but watching MotoGP can give the uninitiated viewer a truly absurd understanding of motorcycle physics. MotoGP kind of sort of agreed, and for a long time, aggressive contact was punished, often with a penalty point that would force the rider to the back of the next race's grid. However, contact in MotoGP is tricky, and like any sport, it is hard to prove intent. Biaggi would not be penalized because it is hard to prove he intended to run Valentino off the track, even if the video surely looks like that was the intent. I was just airing out my pits. Yeah. I was just I was <laughs> <saying> the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> you can't prove I wasn't <laughs> didn't have sweaty pits. I already took a shower. <laughs> <laughs> this rivalry 
<laughs> the <laughs> rivalry like... between Rossi and Biaggi was dry powder to the Italian mafia. Mafia? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we could use all this dry powder in our bullets. <laughs> <laughs> dry powder. <laughs> We're keeping this in the dry powder to the Italian media. And the contact in the Suzuka race was the spark. The likable and approachable Rossi from a small. I just want to say <laughs> if you have a ton of gunpowder, like your, then your first thought is to like make it smaller and put it in bullets. I just think that's the most hilarious use. It's not like blowing something up. It's like, we're going to put it in our bullets. Well, I love that. They have their like dynamite and their C four for blowing <laughs> stuff sticks. up. Okay. If you try to make a bomb out of dry powder, mm -hmm. that's super unstable. Okay. Right? Am I wrong? I've never done it. Well, I I haven't I'm watched Demolition Ranch in a while, but so many digressions on this one today. Um so yeah, the likable and approachable Rossi was from a small region of Italy, always happy to talk to reporters and fans, versus the stoic and detached Biaggi from the big city. The roles were set and the papers flew off the shelves. Valentino was the hero to Biaggi's villain. At the Catalan Grand Prix, the two reportedly got into a fist fight just steps away from the podium, with both camps later claiming the other had started the altercation. Biaggi, now with a mark on his face, was asked by a reporter what had happened, to which he responded, I must have been bitten by a mosquito. Nice, dude. Got his ass. <laughs> in reality, the two battled it out in the papers much more closely than on the track. Rossi was clearly ascendant in the 2001 season, and no amount of ink spilled, drawing comparisons to the Capulets or Montagues, and there was a lot, could contain what was clearly a breakout season for the new Romeo of Moto Grand Prix. The two riders were game to continue bickering, however, and whether it was founded in genuine dislike or adept career management is unknowable. Damn Amidst it. the haze of a dramatic rivalry, a light through yonder window broke. Valentino would win his first Premier Class Championship at the end of the 2001 season. That's a line from Romeo and Juliet. It is. It's a yeah. ambic pentameter. 2002 saw MotoGP finally bid farewell to mixing gas and slapping ass, ditching the 500cc two-stroke engines for a proper four-stroke 990cc big boy. Damn, let's go. While many riders had understandable growing pains working out the larger bikes and differently proportioned engines, Rossi would trade his Honda NSR 500 for an RC 211V and win another championship. You guys are all, uh, you're super like in the RC 211V camp. Uh, yeah. You're like super in the Honda yeah. Yeah. NSR 500 it's camp. It's true. Right? It's true. That's why Nolan and I don't get along. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to fight after this. Nice. Valentino would end the season with 355 points in 11 wins, which is a lot, and four second places, with Biaggi taking second with 215 points and two wins. With a points wins disparity this conclusive, between the first and second place finishers, coupled with back-to-back -back championships, it wasn't long before the media started whispering, generational talent. Generational talent. <laughs> <laughs> it helped that Valentino was also a dream athlete in the European tabloids, long bored with trying to pin scandals on carefully manicured soccer stars who had a net zero collective personality. Valentino was aggressively Italian, his switch from Aprilia to Honda notwithstanding, yet often answered questions in English, hinting at a keen understanding of how MotoGP's international success could hinge on a single, celebrated rider, creating sound bites for a wider audience. His personality was perfectly eccentric for the press, taking blow-up dolls on victory laps, wearing a Robin Hood costume on the podium after his win at the British GP outside Sherwood Forest. I love that. That is really cool. That's great. And his curious pre-race superstitions. Valentino would approach his bike on the grid always from the right, bend down at the waist, touch his feet, and slide his hands over his knee pads, then squat next to his bike, grab the foot peg, and bow his head. I think every racer has their own kind of like pre-race ritual like that. Yeah. I'm, like, there's I, also though some, I've, I've heard the, I don't know, the stance, let's call it, of don't give yourself a pre-fight hmm. or pre-race ritual because you might screw it up one time. Yeah, and then that gets and then, head. And then you're done. Yeah. And so the there's also that, oh, that like the other that. side of... When I'm going up to the batter's box, I don't take swings. Mm -hmm. I go into it That's super cold uh, yeah. because one time, 10 years ago, it worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. You gave, your, uh, you gave yourself a routine of not having a routine. Yeah. That's... I also don't stretch. 
Which is probably none of bad. this is coming as a surprise to me, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I read somewhere, yeah, probably ten, eight years ago, that like stretching doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, but I and that was in uh, from one of Bart's uh, manly man fitness influencers or here stretching. Yeah, from. Liver King mm-hmm. told yeah. you oh, never yeah. stretch <laughs> ever. He's a nice stretching guy. is for wimps. Don't stretch. <laughs> it shows weakness to the other men nearby. <clears throat> So, speaking on his superstitions, leaving mm. the pit, he stands on his pegs and pulls at his leathers, first the balls, then his ass. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> That's part of his ritual. He's got to do that. Okay. Um, so, finally, as he waits for the start, he checks and rechecks his helmet strap and gloves over and over like Nomar Garcia Para. Nomar Garcia Para. Nomar. Before he gets into the batter's box uh he would would painstakingly add the same type of stickers to every new bike including an italian scooter registration sticker which is sick that's That's awesome i love that all this showmanship was backed up by a remarkably goofy adolescent approachability that made him a perfect centerpiece riders like max biaggi were more interested off the track in keeping the press at arm's length answering questions succinctly and concentrating on training or the spoils of victory so that's what Max Biaggi type did. Valentino was opposite. Valentino seemed to truly enjoy every element of racing that exists off the course, and the press couldn't stop covering him. It, I do think if you watch, if you can find interviews with him, he has this weird, unique quality. He's, he's, it's like he's talking to a friend, yeah. you know, like he's just hanging out and like, can you believe what just, you know, like yeah. he's just kind of storytelling and they'll ask him a question, he'll dive into it. Yeah. And it's always, you know, it's, it's easy to see why he, he was covered the way he was. He kind of uses it as a tool like celebrities do. Mm-hmm. They'll call, you know, Taylor Swift, they'll call up the paparazzi and be like, I'm hanging, hanging out with uh, Sabrina Carpenter in London. You're going to want to see us coming mm-hmm. out of this Woolworths. <laughs> as the 2003 season began, all eyes were on Valentino, now firmly known across the racing world. With two premier titles under his belt in just three years, the level of excitement was palpable. The season began with a win at the Japan Grand Prix by Rossi, but celebrations would be short-lived. On lap four, Dajiro Kato, who was behind the pack, suffered a catastrophic loss of rear grip, causing him to crash head-on into a barrier at 140 yeah. kilometers per hour. Because Kato was behind, the extent of the crash was not immediately known, so the yellow flag was waved. He'd be helicoptered out during the race and die from his injuries two weeks later. Kato's teammate, Sete Gibernau, would emerge as Rossi's adversary for the remainder of the season. Gibernau, a Spanish rider, was not the arrogant mark Biaggi played. He emerged from the Japanese Grand Prix a changed competitor, having dealt with his teammate dying. Their duels in the races were a real marvel of intuition and technique, seeming more like a chess match than a race. But in the end, Rossi was too confident and too skilled. He would take the championship for the third year in a row. 2004 saw Rossi announcing his intention to leave Honda, a move widely regarded as a negotiation tactic to force their hand at a better contract. Rossi had been moved to go to Honda almost certainly to race their perfect RC211 V, but in the ensuing years, Rossi had become disillusioned. The bike was a great machine. However, Honda's celebration of the machine winning titles and not the person riding it became a sore spot for the three-time champ. This public frustration opened a door that no one could have expected at the time. Yamaha had not won a premier crown in 12 years, and in 2003, they did not win a single race. Leadership at Yamaha also resisted the idea of signing Rossi, worrying that should he take another title on their bike, it would effectively prove Valentino's point at their cost. He could win on any bike. Whoa, this is a weird uh, weird situation. I thought that you thought. That I thought, but if you think, then I'm going to... Yeah. 7D chess. Yeah. Yamaha would court Valentino aggressively during the 2003 season, but in secret, going as far as to have meetings in the medical tent late at night after everyone had left. Valentino would ultimately sign a deal with Yamaha worth $15 million a year, approximately 26 mil today. Wow. For an example of scale, Mark Marquez's current contract almost 20 years later is valued at only $20 million per year. Wow. So that's, I mean, is that a testament to MotoGP's uh, engagement dropping a little bit? Uh, I would also say Mark. I think uh, it's also, I think it's more just saying how important this was mm-hmm. to Yamaha to yeah. be like, we're all in. That seems like, like a lot because MotoGP, 
I don't know. It doesn't seem like because F1 drivers, mm-hmm. twenty six million dollar contract is pretty par. That's pretty good. good. Yeah. That's a good contract. And F1 pulls in a lot more money than MotoGP. But I guess their cars don't. There's less overhead for building a bike than a car. In the offseason, Max Biaggi also made a change. He was now riding for Valentino's previous team, Honda. To be crystal clear, this effectively meant that Valentino and Biaggi would trade bikes for the 2004 season. The champion and his rival who had finished the previous season in third. Valentino, ever conscious of showmanship, understood that the rivalry was important to the media. But in reality, he was competing against Honda's bike, as the point disparity between himself and Biaggi in 2003 was vast. The season started with a three-time champ ready to prove he can beat his own championship bike. At the South Africa Grand Prix opener, Rossi and Biaggi would battle it out the whole race, with Rossi taking that flag and eight others to win the championship for the fourth straight year in a row. Yamaha would have to settle for never knowing if it was their man or the machine. I think a little bit of both. I think a little bit of both. In 2005, Yamaha and Rossi would increase their domination with 11 wins for a fifth consecutive championship year. It was also the year that the cracks in Valentino's riding would start to emerge. At the Yaris Grand Prix, Valentino had been in an intense battle with Seta Gibernau for the lead when, in the final turn before the flag, Rossi would push Gibernau off the track from the inside lane of the turn, knocking him off the track and securing his victory. There is no penalty to Rossi, and in a 2020 interview, Gibernau stated, quote, from that moment on, it opened the door for it to happen many more times. And he was absolutely correct. Moto Grand Prix in the early aughts looks almost totally different from the current series. The idea of acceptable contact, which is pretty objectively a laughable one, seems to be that any contact which causes a wreck is unacceptable. But if the person can stand the bike, then it's probably okay. Regardless, as time progresses, Rossi's contact with Gibernau would not be his last controversy. The 2006 season was an absolute cascade of bad luck for the five-time champion. Rossi would crash out in a few races, but keep himself in the running. By the Valencia GP, Rossi had overcome a 51-point deficit in just five rounds to enter the last race of the season eight points ahead and in pole position. Always with a flair for the dramatic, Rossi was one flag from his sixth championship. To say it was a shock when Rossi flubbed the start and was still in seventh by the fifth lap is a profound understatement. This is The Doctor, a nickname given Rossi by his team and the press for any number of reasons, but for most likely of which was his ability to remain calm under pressure. A crash during lap five dashed his chance of yet another title that year, and thus ended Rossi's incredible five-in-a-row championship run in MotoGP, bested only by Giacomo Agostini's seven titles in a row from 1966 to 1972. 2007 was the year Valentino, along with the rest of the grid, chased Casey Stoner's Ducati all season. He finished third for the first time since entering Premier Class. It is around this point that the media, who so eagerly covered the blow-by-blow of Rossi's battles, began to publish articles with titles like, Can Valentino Rossi ever win another title? Or, Is Valentino Rossi done? Is he cooked? (laughs) (laughs) Valentino low-key mid. (laughs) (laughs) But everyone knows that there is only one better storyline. A former champion whose crown has lost its luster, returning against all odds to the top of the heap. And in 2008, they all got to write that article about the doctor. At his championship podium, Rossi wore a t-shirt that read in Italian, Sorry for the delay. Oh, that's another thing. Uh... Southern Italians are notoriously not on time for anything. Mm. So maybe that was a nod to that. (laughs) While Rossi would win his ninth and final championship the following year in 2009, he continued to race. After an abysmal 2011-2012 with the Ducati team, where Valentino attempted to replicate Stoner's dominance with their Desmo Sedici, Valentino would return to Yamaha for the remainder of his career. By this point in Valle's career, his hometown of Tivulia had already changed the aforementioned speed limit in his honor, while their town square hosted a pizza shop, merchandise shop, gelateria, bottega, and bar in his honor. And while Rossi's achievements alone would give rise to a certain amount of celebration, he was not a prodigal son. Rossi had built a 32,000 square foot headquarters in the town, housing his business's headquarters and his VR46 Riders Academy. 
Valentino had become Tivulia's largest employer. That's cool. I think that's really cool to go back to like your hometown like that, especially if it's a small town and uh, kind of give back a little bit. Yeah, give back, that way. pay homage. I love that. The Academy allowed Valentino to foster his dream of Italian motorcycle racing dominance. In the words of VR6 writer Franco Morbidelli, The Academy and the ranch are like Florence was in the Renaissance times for artists and poets. The Academy also allowed Valentino to stay competitive in MotoGP as he was mentoring young riders while also being challenged by them. The 2013 season opener with Valentino again riding for Yamaha showcased his determination and training, allowing the veteran a win and fanning the hopes of his enormous fan base. But he would finish the season almost 100 points behind his teammate, Jorge Lorenzo. It could also be George. George Lorenzo. Depending on where he's from. Mm-hmm. Cover both bases. The following season, Valentino would struggle in qualifying, clinching only three front starts, but leading in points for the majority of the season. The 2014 season saw Valentino perhaps at his best, but an argument could be made that his Saturday weakness led to an outsized drama on Sunday watching him compete from the back of the grid. Valentino would take second place from 2014 to 2016 and fall off to seventh in 2017. However, 2018 would be a true soap opera. By that year, he was competing with graduates of his own riding academy. But, like our favorite Lightning McQueen... (laughs) Valentino felt he had another championship in him. Unfortunately, the doctor had to contend with Mark Marquez. Marquez, dude. Marquez was frustrated with Valentino since his rookie season in 2013, with Valentino taking a penalty after making deliberate contact with Marquez at the 2015 Malaysian GP. Can't be doing that. No, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, uh. (laughs) Marquez would crash as a result, and Valentino was very vocal in the media that he believed the rider was deliberately slowing the pace of the races. Valentino, by this point, was very savvy in using his press time to focus attention on how certain competitors were racing inappropriately. A kind of a hypocrite at this point. Late in the Argentine GP, Marquez would make contact with Rossi in a corner and crash him out of the race. Valentino is apoplectic in his presser afterwards, claiming this is a very bad situation because 300 kilometer per hour on the track, you have to have respect for your rival. You have to be strong. You have to make the maximum. But like this, it is over. This is from a man whose own father is quoted as saying, when you put your helmet on, you must show respect to no one. Valentino is good at this. One would imagine Sete Giberno also must have felt somewhat satisfied to see the well-crafted Italian loafer was now on the other foot. Rossi would battle Marquez on the track and in the press for the remainder of the 2018 season and finish second. Rossi would race for another three years with exponentially diminishing returns until his retirement from MotoGP in 2021. So that's that's pretty time. nuts. Yeah. Especially for Does he have another rider. 20 years in him, though? We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> While Rossi would hang up his leathers in 2021, he would hold on to his helmet and in 2022 join Team WRT, a Belgian endurance racing organization, driving an Audi R8 LMS, oh, nice. obviously yeah. emblazoned with his 46. Valentino would compete in both the Endurance and Sprint Cups for the FIA World Endurance Series. While he would finish the season in 17th place, Rossi was excited to begin his new journey on four wheels. 2023 saw WRT switch to driving the BMW M4 GT3 and Rossi taking his first auto racing win at Masano. He still sticks his knee out the door. (laughs) (laughs) And and this year, Valentino Rossi, one of the greatest motorcycle racers of all time, competed in the 24 hours of Le Mans, but did not finish. It would be absurd to imagine any conversation about MotoGP in its current era without hearing one mention of Valentino Rossi. His aggressiveness on the course and his technical adroitness were unparalleled, while his ability to have the press eat out of his hand is still a feat in and of itself. Even those critical of Rossi's approach, both in conversations about contact or about utilizing the press to air grievances about other racers, would be remiss to even hint that he was anything less than a top three all-time racer. Outside of these esoteric conversations, however, one thing is known. Should you happen upon Tavulia, Italy, there's only one correct answer to who is the greatest motorcycle racer of all time. And if you're in a bar or restaurant, you likely won't have to look far to see his name. Pazzo. What's that mean? Crazy. 
dude, we're learning so much Italian. Uh, right yeah, now. I feel like I see it everywhere now. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, we got some listener mail this week. Yeah. So this is from Dawson. Dawson. Hey, guys, just wanted to say thank you for all the vids and podcasts. You guys have taught me so much about cars from around the world. I didn't even know existed. All I know from living in Montana is trucks and tractors. You also opened me to F1, and I'm now building my own dirt oval car. I thought you were going to say you were going to build, you're building your own F1 car. (laughs) And I will probably rock a donut sticker on it. Heck yeah. Well, then you could expect a cease and desist letter. (laughs) No, no. You can rock one. We'll send you some stickers if you want. Yeah. Um, That's uh, cool. We'll reach out to you after this podcast, and we'll get your, your info. Nolan said he was recently in Butte and Anaconda for his sister's wedding. I was. I actually saw him and thought the only reason he would be in Montana was for vacation, so I decided not to bother him. Hey, nice. Uh, I'm sure he <laughs> appreciated that. Thanks for not that. talking to me. As <laughs> a Chappelle just... Roan fan, uh, you probably yeah. know what she's going through right <laughs> yeah. now with some parasocial relationships. That's right. No, I mean, I don't know, but I guess I wouldn't. Nolan is very gracious. I've been out with him a million times where fans come up. He is... The mo- uh, him and Justin are great with fans mm-hmm. coming up, so I don't think he would have had a problem. I would not have had a problem. If you ever see me out, dude, I'm just going to come out to Anaconda and look for Dawson now. Yeah. Um, no, but if you ever see me out, say what's up. I like yeah. I like saying hi. Everyone has always, everyone who's ever said hi has been cool. Yeah. There's never been any assholes or anything like that. It's been really cool. You guys are awesome. Especially when you, when you say you listen to Pass Gas or Big Three, too, I'm like, that's, yeah. you, you rock! But anyways, thank you, Dawson. Uh, uh, you know, hope that dirt track car is cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Build it. That's that's super cool. Heck yeah. Okay, if you'd like to hit us up, uh, send us an email at passgas at donutmedia.com. We might read it on the air. Bart, thank you so much for being here. Always a pleasure. Thanks, yeah, gentlemen. Bart. Follow Bart at BidsBardo. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Yeah. <laughs> and follow me at Nolan J. Sykes if you'd like. And we'll see you next time. All right. Bye. Bye.